Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering respiratory. If you haven't done so already, please don't forget, go ahead, like, and subscribe to this channel, and make sure you press that notification button. That's um, whenever I upload a new video, you'll be notified. So without any further ado, let's get started. First question. The nurse is working with a licensed practical nurse and an unlicensed assistive personnel to care for a group of clients. Which nursing task should not be delegated or assigned? One, the routine oral medication for the clients. Two, bed, bath, and oral care. Three, evaluating the client's progress. Or four, transporting a client to dialysis. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. The correct answer is three, evaluating a, cli a client's uh, progress. Guys, another word for evaluate is assess. That is the job of the RN, right? The RN has to assess that patient. Now let's look at these other choices. You have one, routine oral medication for the clients. Routine meds, you can delegate that to the LPN. LPN can give routine meds. LPN can see that patient that's stable, right? So one, you can delegate that to the LPN, not the, not the UAP because the UAP can't give meds, but the LPN can. Two, bed, bath, and oral care. You can delegate that. That you can delegate to the unlicensed assistant personnel. Four, transporting the client to um, dialysis. You can delegate that to the UAP. The UAPs can do lots of things. Yes, they're unlicensed, but they're allowed to do oral care, or they're allowed to do oral care. They're allowed to transport patients. They're allowed to transport equipment, right? So there are lots of things that the unlicensed assistive personnel can do. They can remind the patient about what the nurse has taught. But three, evaluating the client's progress, that's the job of the RN. Because remember, the RN is the one that's making the care plan and making the adjustments to the care plan. The RN has to assess the patient. Next question. Which client should the charge nurse assign to the new graduate on the respiratory unit? One, the client diagnosed with lung cancer who has rust-colored sputum and chest pain of 10 on a scale of 1 to 10. Two, the client diagnosed with atelectasis who's having shortness of breath and difficulty breathing. Three, the client diagnosed with tuber tuberculosis who has a non-productive cough in orange-colored urine. Or four, Client diagnosed with pneumonia who has a pulse ox reading of 91 and CRT more than three seconds. Now I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. So guys, the correct answer is three. The client diagnosed with TB, non-productive cough, orange colored urine. Why? Why would we give this to the new graduate? This client is the most stable out of all the patients that we're seeing. Okay, look at three. The client has TB, they have a non-productive cough. Well, when you have TB, you do have a non-productive cough. And the urine is orange. Why? Because of the rifampin that they're taking, right? Remember, when a patient with TB, they're taking rifampin, you have to teach them that it's going to change the color of their secretions. Their urine will turn orange. Even their tears can turn orange. So if that patient's wearing uh, contacts, they need to switch to glasses, right? Because they'll stain their contacts. So this patient is the most stable out of the whole list. Let's look at our other choices. One, a client with lung cancer who has rust-colored sputum, chest pain of 10. 10 is the worst, guys. That patient's not stable. We're not going to give that to a new grad. Two, client diagnosed with atelectasis who's having shortness of breath, difficulty breathing. That patient's not stable. We are not going to give that to a new grad. And then choice four, the client diagnosed with pneumonia, pulse ox of 91. First of all, guys, we want that O2 sat 98 to 100, right? If it's 95, we'll take it, but we really want it 98 to 100. But at 91, your O2 sat, mm-mm you're going into respiratory dis distress, okay? And so obviously that patient's not stable. So the only stable one out of this group is number three. Next question, this is select all that applies. Don't forget what I taught you about select all that applies. You're gonna treat them as true or false. Select the task appropriate to assign to an unlicensed assistive personnel. One, perform mouth care on the client with pneumonia. 
Two, apply oxygen via nasal cannula to the client. Three, empty the trash cans in the client's room. Four, take the empty blood bag back to the laboratory. Five, show the client how to ambulate on the walker. All right, guys, so I'll tell you what the answer is, and we're going to treat them true or false, okay? Number one, perform mouth care on the client with pneumonia. True. You can delegate that to the unlicensed assistive personnel. As a matter of fact, you should, because remember, those patients who are sick in the hospital, especially if they can't do it for themselves, this patient has pneumonia, you want to do frequent oral care because the last thing you want is bacteria to just start to accumulate in the mouth. And what do you think it does? It just creeps down and goes into the patient's lungs. So yes on number one. Two, apply oxygen via nasal cannula to the client. No, absolutely not. Why? Oxygen is considered a medication. Can you just give a patient oxygen? No, it has to be ordered. So no, the CNA or the UAP can't do that. Three, empty trash cans in the client's room. False, that's the job of who? Of housekeeping, not the CNA. Four, take the empty blood bag back to the laboratory. True. Remember, unlicensed assistive personnel, they're allowed to transport equipment. They're allowed to transport medication. They're allowed to transport blood. They're not giving it to the patient. They're just transporting it from one place to another. So absolutely. And then five, show the client how to ambulate on the walker. That is false. That's teaching. And the unlicensed assistive personnel cannot teach the patient. That is the job of the licensed nurse. So the correct answers for that is one and four. Which client should the medical unit nurse assess first after receiving shift report? One. The 84-year-old client diagnosed with pneumonia whose AFI brow but getting restless. Two, 25-year-old diagnosed with influenza whose fee brow and has a headache. Three, 56-year-old client diagnosed with a left-sided hemothorax with tidling in the water seal compartment of the pleurovac. Four, 38-year-old client diagnosed with sinus infection who has green drainage from the nose. And the correct answer is one. Whenever you see a question asking you, who do you see first? Really what they're asking you, who is the priority? Who's the worst patient out of the group? And this one is one. So here's what's going on. You have an 84-year-old client diagnosed with pneumonia who's a febrile. Well, the a febrile, that's good, right? But you keep reading and it says, but it's getting restless. Want to know what that means? That symptom of that patient getting restless, they're not getting enough oxygen to the brain. That's what you need to be suspecting. So you're going to be running to that patient. Whenever you have a change in the level of consciousness of a patient, that is a priority. You're going to be running to the patient. And here's something else that says that the client's 84 years old with the elderly, the geriatric population. Um, one of the first signs of infection is a change in level of consciousness. So um, infection, um, not enough oxygen, that change in the level of consciousness, you're going to be running to that patient out of um, all the other um, situations we were giving in this scenario. Look at the other choices because I want to go over the reasons why the other choices are wrong. Two, you have a 25-year-old diagnosed with the flu. They have a fever and a headache. Well, fever and headache, those are two manifestations of influenza, right? So we're expecting to see that. I mean, we don't, want to, we don't want that to happen to them, but that is what we see with that disease process. Three, or with that uh, infection, I should say. Three, the 56-year-old client with the left-sided hemothorax. The minute you hear hemothorax, you're thinking of what? Chest tube. That patient's going to have a chest tube, right? With tidling in the water seal compartment. That's good. We want to see tidling, right? We want to see as they're breathing in and out, we want to see the bubbling go up and down. That's what we expect to see. So there's nothing wrong with that. This is expected. And then you have number four, the 38-year-old diagnosed with a sinus infection with green drainage. Yeah, that green drainage is that purulent drainage that's coming from the sinus infection. That is expected. You expect to see that kind of drainage in a sinus infection. So... Without a doubt, 
the patient you're going to run to first because they're the most unstable, all right, is number one. Whenever you get a question saying, who are you going to first? What they're really asking you is who is most unstable out of the list that you're given. A client who's two days post-op following a left pneumonectomy has an apical pulse rate of 128 beats per minute, blood pressure of 80 over 50. Which intervention should the nurse implement first? One, notify the doctor immediately. Two, assess the client's incisional wound. Three, prepare to administer dopamine, a vasopressor. Three, increase the client's IV rate. The correct answer is six, guys. Increase the client's IV rate. The, the um, situation that we have here, that patient is starting to go through shock, right? There, um, those uh, tissues, those organs are not being perfused, okay? They possibly may be losing blood, but they're definitely starting to go through shock. How do we know that? Because the pulse is going up, and the blood pressure is going down. So what happens is when the patient's bleeding out, when uh, those tissues and organs and cells, they're not getting enough blood that they need, right? The blood pressure starts to go down because there aren't, there's no blood in the vessels. So blood pressure is going down. The heart tries to compensate. The heart's like, oh my gosh, I don't know what's happening, but let me try to help. So the heart increases its rate because it's trying to push out more blood, blood that it doesn't have, but it's trying. It's trying to help the body. Your body is designed to survive no matter what. It tries its hardest to survive. So whenever you see a situation with the blood pressure going down and that pulse going up, you need to be thinking shock. And so the first thing you're going to do, you're going to increase the IV rate because you want to increase what? The fluids. You want to increase the fluids that are in the vessel to help that blood pressure go up. Okay? Let's look at our other choices. One, notify the doctor immediately. You guys got to be careful about this. Before you choose the answer of notifying the doctor, say to yourself, is there anything that I can do to help my patient before I take this step? Okay? Because you're going to call the doctor. You're going to tell the doctor, yeah, the blood pressure went down, heart rate went up, but I did X, Y, Z. You have to, most of the time, there's something that you can do to help your patient before you call the doctor. So look on the list and say to yourself, can I do any of these before I turn my back to the patient? to the patient to call the doctor. Then you have choice to assess the client's incisional wound. We can do that later. At this point, we don't care why they're going through shock. We just want to fix the problem. Later, you can look at the wound and see, okay, maybe they were bleeding out. That's what caused them to start going through shock. But at this point, we don't care. We want to fix the problem. Three, prepare to administer dopamine, a vasopressor. Guess what? Vasopressors, yes, they increase the blood pressure, but you got to have fluid in your vessels for that blood pressure to go up, right? So the first thing you're going to do is increase the fluids. So you call the doctor, doctor's going to order a vasopressor. Great, we're going to give it. But in the meantime, you increase those fluids, you help the patient get more fluids in the vessels, and you kept those vessels from collapsing. Next question. The client who's one day post-op following chest surgery is having difficulty breathing, has bilateral rails, and is confused and restless. Which intervention should the nurse implement first? One, assess the pulse ox reading. Two, notify the rapid response team. Three, place the client in Trendelenburg position. Four, check the client's surgical dressing. And the correct answer is two. You're going to contact the rapid response team and you're going to get help right away. This patient is going through acute respiratory distress syndrome. Okay. That's what's happening with this patient. Let's look at our other choices so you can know why the other choices are wrong. One, assess the pulse ox. Let me tell you something. Whenever you're going to choose um, an answer, you have to say to yourself, what can I do with this answer? What is this answer telling me that I don't already know? One, assess the client's pulse ox. What is that going to do for you? Go back to the question. Difficulty breathing, bilateral rails, confused and restless. 
All that pulse ox is going to do is tell you that this patient can't breathe, which we already know. They just told us the patient having difficulty breathing, and they gave us all of these other clinical manifestations. They already um, painted a picture for us. There's no need to check the pulse ox. We already know this patient can't breathe. Number three, place the client in Trendelenburg position. There is nothing in this question that made us think that the patient's going through shock. There's no reason for us to put this patient in Trendelenburg position. Four, check the client's surgical dressing. For what? This patient can't breathe, okay? There's nothing that tells us that this patient's bleeding anywhere. And even if they were, we'd be trying to stop the bleeding, right? We wouldn't be checking the site. All of that can happen later. So we have to fix the problem. So you're going to call the rapid response team so we can help the patient immediately. The client in the post-anesthesia care unit, PACU, has noisy and irregular respirations with a pulse ox of 89. Which intervention should the PACU nurse implement first? One, increase the client's oxygen rate via nasal cannula. Two, notify the respiratory therapist to draw arterial blood gases. Three, tilt the head back and push forward on the angle of the lower jaw. Or four, Obtain an intubation tray and prepare for emergency intubation. Okay, guys, so the correct answer is number three. You want to tilt the head back, push forward on the angle of the lower jaw. Why? This person's in patients in PACU, which means they just had what? Anesthesia, okay? So what's most likely happening, their tongue has gone back and is occluding the airway, right? So when you do this, you're helping that tongue to come back down so the patient can have a patent airway so that patient can breathe, okay? So that's the first thing you're going to do. And they gave us a hint when they let us know that that patient just came from PACU. The day surgery admission nurse is obtaining operative permits for clients having surgery. Which client should the nurse question signing the consent form? One, 16-year-old married client who's diagnosed with an ectopic pregnancy. Two, a 39-year-old client diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. Three, 50-year-old who admits to being a recovering alcoholic. Four, an 84-year-old client diagnosed with COPD. And the correct answer, guys, is to the 39-year-old client with uh, diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. Why? This patient has uh, paranoid schizophrenia, which um, is a psych issue. This patient may not be competent to sign, okay? They might not be competent to sign for themselves. But look at our, all our other choices. We have one. 16-year-old married client diagnosed with ectopic pregnancy. You want to, you want to know what makes her um, um, able to sign illegally? She's married. So legally, even if someone's underage, if they're married, they're considered um, an adult that can make those decisions for themselves. If they're in the army, if they've been emancipated, right? And let's say a 16-year-old doesn't fall into this category. She's not married. She's not emancipated. She's not in the army, right? She's 16. But if she's pregnant, that's the fourth one. If she's pregnant, she can make those decisions for her baby, but not for herself. How crazy is that? And so lots of times I'll see test questions where a teenager, an unmarried teenager is in the hospital. She's pregnant and um, who's allowed to make the decision for her child. And it's not her parents, it's her. She's allowed to make the decision for her child, but she's not allowed to make the decisions for herself. Her parents have to make the decision for her, okay? Unless she falls under those previous categories that I just mentioned. Three, a 50-year-old recovering, 50-year-old um, client who admits to being a recovering alcoholic. There's nothing about that that would say that patient's not competent to make their own decisions. However, something we would be worried about, what do we know about alcohol? Bleeding, right? So 
if they're recovering alcoholic, we would be asking them questions. When's the last time you had alcohol? Um, alcohol. You know, the doctor's probably going to run tests, liver function tests, such as the ALT and AST, because the last thing that they want, once that patient gets a surgery and that scalpel cuts them open, that patient's bleeding out all over the place because of all that alcohol that was in their system. So that would be a concern. Bleeding would be, be a concern, but not consent. There's nothing in this question that tells us that would be an issue. And then, of course, for the 84-year-old with COPD, nothing wrong with that either. So the only one that you'd question if um, this consent was legal, that patient with schizophrenia. Okay? Next question. The nurse is caring for a client diagnosed with flail chest who has a chest tube for three days. The nurse notes there's no tidling in the water seal compartment. Which initial action should be taken by the nurse? One, check the tubing for any dependent loops. Two, auscultate the client's posterior breath sounds. Three, prepare to remove the client's chest tubes. Four, notify the doctor that the lungs have re-expanded. So the correct answer is to auscultate the client's posterior breath sounds. Now remember, I told you that we expect to see that tidling in the water seal chamber as they're breathing in and out. We expect to go up and down, up and down. But guess what? As that patient's lung finally re-expands, they're going to be breathing and we're not going to see the tidling anymore. So the time, that's your key, okay? If you get a question and says the patient uh, just got the chest tube inserted, there's no tidling, well, guess what? Obviously, you know, they just got the chest tube. Did they all of a sudden miraculously heal and now the lung is expanding on its own? No, you're going to be looking for kinks, right? But if it's been a couple days and you don't see any tidling, tid tidling what can that mean? Any tidling? I can't speak, guys. That means that maybe that client's lung has finally re-expanded. So the first thing you're going to do, listen, auscultate. Do you hear those breath sounds? And if you do, then you can call the physician and say, hey, I noticed there was no tidling in the water seal chamber. When I listen to the lungs, they're nice and clear. I can hear those breath sounds, right? And then the doctor might make the order to do a chest x-ray for confirmation, remove the chest uh, tube, all that good stuff. But... For this question, your key is the time frame. If that patient just got a chest tube, trust me, they didn't miraculously heal. You're going to be looking for kinks in the tubing that's somewhere, right? But if it's been a couple days, they're breathing in and out, and you don't see any tidling, most likely that lung has re-expanded. So you want to assess, take a listen, and then call the doctor. The client with the right-sided pneumothorax has had a chest tube inserted two hours ago. There's no fluctuation in the water seal chamber of the pleurovac. Which intervention should the nurse implement first? One, assess the client's lung sounds. Two, check for any kinks in the tubing. Three, ask the client to take deep breaths. Or four, turn the client from side to side. Since I just gave you the answer, I hope you chose two. Check for any kinks in the tubing. It was just inserted two hours ago. You think that client just miraculously healed and all of a sudden their lungs are re-expanded? No. There's probably a kink in the tubing, so that's what you're going to do. I'm telling you guys, that time frame is your key to figure out, do you look for kinks in the tubing or do you assess the lung sounds first, okay? So in this situation, they just got the chest tube two hours ago, right? There's no way that their lungs have already re-expanded. So the first thing we're going to do is check for kinks in the tubing. The client in the intensive care unit is on a ventilator. Which intervention should the nurse implement? Select all that applies. Remember guys, we treat select all that applies as what? True and false. One, ensure there's a manual resuscitation bag at the bedside. True, because if something happens to that machine, you're gonna to have to manually pump that air into the patient's lungs. Two, monitor the client's pulse ox reading every shift false. Every shift, so if you're working an eight-hour shift or a 12-hour shift, you're only checking it one time. No, you're going to be checking that pulse off and looking at it every two hours, every four hours at the most.
but not every chef. Three, assess the client's respiratory status every two hours. True, you want to check on your patient, look to see and make sure that they're breathing. Three, uh, excuse me, four, check the ventilator settings every four hours. True, yes, you want to make sure, see, patient comes before machine. So yes, you're going to be checking your patient every two hours, but every four hours, you're going to make sure everything on that machine is running the way it should. And then five, collaborate with the respiratory therapist. True, absolutely, absolutely. Respiratory therapy is gonna be on this case. The female charge nurse on the respiratory unit tells the male nurse, you're really cute and have a great body. Do you work out? Which action should be taken by the male nurse if he thinks he's being sexually harassed? One, document the comment in writing and tell another staff nurse. Two, ask the charge nurse to stop making comments like this. Three, notify the clinical manage manager of the sexual harassment. Four, report this to corporate headquarters office. Now I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. The correct answer is two. I can't stress this enough, guys. Whenever there's conflict that arises, and there will be because you're human, right? Whenever there's conflict that arises, Unless the patient is in danger, you go directly to that person that you have a conflict with. Always, okay? Someone's doing something you don't like, coworker, you talk to them first. It could have been a misunderstanding. You talk to them, maybe, you know, they didn't realize how their behavior was affecting you or anybody else and give them a chance to stop. You always go to the person first. Unless patient care is involved, unless that patient's in danger, right? You go to the uh, person that you have the conflict first. Now, after he's talked to that nurse manager, if she continues this behavior, then he can go up the chain of command, go to her supervisor, okay? But you always go to the person that you have the conflict with first. Like I said, the only time you do not follow this rule, for example, if a conflict is because you suspect you don't even confirm. You suspect that the nurse is drunk or the nurse is high. Because patient care is involved, the patients are at risk, you don't go directly to that person, that nurse that you think is drunk or high. You're going to go to your supervisor or their supervisor. That's the only time you skip that chain of command of going to the person first. That's only when the patients are at risk. Okay. The charge nurse in the ICU asks a nurse to float from the medical surgical unit to the ICU. Which client should the charge nurse assign to the float nurse? One, the client who's three hours post-op lung transplant. Two, the client who has a central venous pressure of 13. Three, the client who's diagnosed with bacterial pneumonia. Four, the client who's diagnosed with hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. And the correct answer is three. Why three? Three is the most stable patient, okay? So that patient is the one that you're gonna to give to that float nurse. You wanna give the most stable patient, the patient that's not going to require so much in-depth assessment, so much uh, um, uh, um, just um, monitoring, right? All of the other patients, you have to be monitoring them very, very, very closely. All of them are critical. But this patient number three out of our choices that we were giving is by far the most stable patient. So that's who you're going to give to that floating nurse. The client has arterial blood gas values of pH 7.38, PO2 77, PaCO2 40, and bicarb 24. Which intervention should the critical care nurse implement? One, administer oxygen six liters via nasal cannula. Two, encourage the client to take deep breaths. Three, administer intravenous sodium bicarb. Or four, assess the client's respiratory status. And guys, the correct answer is one. 
giving them oxygen and giving them high flow oxygen. That's six liters. So let's look at the situation, what's going on. You look at the ABGs, seven, uh, pH is 7.38. Okay, good. At least that patient's compensated, right? But look at that PAO2, 77. Partial pressure of oxygen is supposed to be what? 80 to 100. And guys, do not confuse the partial pressure of oxygen, which is 80 to 100. That's your P PAO2 to your O2 sat, your SAO2, which you want what? 98 to 100. So this one is the PAO2, which is the partial pressure of oxygen. You want it at the minimum. At the minimum, 80. The range is 80 to 100. At the minimum, 80. And what's happening with them? It's 77. So what are you going to do? Give them oxygen. Okay, I know some of you guys were tempted to choose for assess their respiratory status. What is that going to tell you? Let's say you assess their respiratory status and you listen to the lungs and they don't look like they're having any difficulty breathing. Does that mean you're not going to give them that oxygen? No. So assessing that respiratory status is not going to change your intervention. That PAO2 is 77. You need to get it up. How do you get it up? By giving them the oxygen. So your correct answer is number one. Number two, take deep breaths. Have them take deep breaths after you give them the oxygen. You have to fix the problem. And of course, number three, give them, giving them sodium bicarb. Their bicarb is 24. The normal bicarb is 22 to 26, so they're well within range. Why are you giving them sodium bicarb? The problem is the partial pressure of oxygen, and your nursing intervention is to give them the oxygen to get that PaO2 up at least to 80, because remember, we want it to be 80 to 100. The client diagnosed with active tuberculosis tells the public health nurse, I am not going to take any more medications. I'm tired of them. Which statement is the nurse's best response? One, you're tired of taking your tuberculosis medications. Two, you must take your TB medications. It is not an option. Three, you must discuss this with your healthcare provider. Four, as long as you wear a mask, you do not have to take the meds. The correct answer is two. You must take your TB medications. It is not an option. And I know some of you guys were tempted to um, choose one of repeating what the client said because you want to explore their feelings. Unfortunately, TB is a public health crisis. That patient has absolutely no choice in this matter. You know, with all these other disease processes, such like it, uh, HIV, high, hypertension, diabetes, you can't force the patient to take their med. They don't want to take their med. They end up dying. It is what it is, right? Unfortunately, guess what? Tuberculosis isn't one of those because it is a public health crisis, okay? That patient that has TB, they're not taking their meds. They're infectious, they get on the subway. They get on a public um, bus transportation and they cough. And those droplets stay suspended in the air for hours. So everybody that walks in the air that that patient had coughed three, four hours ago, breathes in those droplets and now they're infected. Okay? So let me tell you something. When it comes to TB, TB is such a public health crisis and we do not play with TB. There's something called drug um, observed therapy, DOT, drug observed therapy, where the government, the state pays a nurse to come out to that patient's home or wherever they are and watch them take that medication. Yeah. Our tax dollars pay for it. Why? Because that patient, if they're not compliant, they can infect hundreds of people. Okay, so yeah, you let that patient know they don't have a choice. They have to take their meds and they're going to be taking those TB beds a minimum, a minimum of um, six months, but the average is nine to 12 months. Okay, so depending on the patient, sometimes it could be six months, but the average is nine to 12 months that they're going to be taking these medications and they absolutely must be compliant. They have no choice. The unlicensed assistive personnel tells the clinic nurse that the male client in room one is really breathing hard and can't seem to catch his breath. Which instructions should the nurse give to the UAP? 
One, to put four milliliters oxygen on the client. Two, sit the client upright in the chair. Three, go with the nurse to the client's room. Four, take the client's vital signs. The correct answer is three. Go with the nurse to the client's room. So let me make this clear. If you are the nurse and a UAP or anyone for that matter, it could be another nurse, says to you, hey, I noticed X, Y, Z going on with your patient. You don't instruct them to go do anything. You turn around and you go see your patient, okay? I don't care what's going on. The minute somebody comes and tells you something about your patient, you don't tell them to reposition. You don't ask them to go take vitals. Even if that patient does need vitals, you go back to that room to take that patient's vitals. Why? Because while you're taking their vitals, you're eyeballing them from head to toe. You're assessing your patient. You never send somebody back to your patient after they came to tell you something about your patient. The minute they come tell you something about your patient, you drop what you're doing and you go check that patient yourself because you have to assess them, okay? The clinic nurse is scheduling a 14-year-old client for tonsillectomy. Which intervention should the clinic nurse inter uh, excuse me, implement? One, obtain informed consent from the client. Two, send a throat culture to the laboratory. Three, discuss the need to cough and deep breathe. Four, request the laboratory to draw PT and PTT. The correct answer is four, request the lab to draw PT and PTT. Wanna know why? Because if the, that PT and PTT time, if it's extended, that patient's already bleeding, there's not going to be any surgery. That surgery is going to be canceled. So nothing else on the list matters, right? Nothing else matters. So we have to make sure that that patient's clotting time is where it needs to be because we don't want them going into the OR. And as soon as the surgeon cuts into them, they're bleeding all over the place. They bleed out and die, right? So... Number four is the priority because nothing else matters. It doesn't matter getting consent. By the way, the kid's 14, so we wouldn't be getting consent from him anyway. We'd be getting consent from the parents. But it doesn't matter getting consent, getting cultures. None of that matters if that patient's bleeding out and they're not going to be able to get the surgery. So that is going to be our priority in this situation. The client calls the clinic nurse and asks, what is the best way to prevent getting influenza? Which statement, by, which statement is the nurse's best response? One, take prophylactic antibiotics for 10 days after being exposed to influenza. Two, stay away from large crowds and wear a scarf over your mouth during cold weather. Three, the best way to prevent getting influenza is to get a yearly flu vaccine. Four, you must eat three well-balanced meals a day and exercise daily to prevent influenza. The correct answer is three, guys, getting your annual vaccine. That is the best way to prevent getting influenza, right? And um, education, vaccination, that is a primary form of prevention. Let's look at our other choices. One, take prophylactic antibiotics. What is antibiotics going to do? Influenza is a virus. It will do nothing. And let's go a little bit further. It says take antibiotics 10 days after being exposed to influenza. Uh-uh, antibiotics do nothing for a virus, so get that out the way. Two, stay away from large crowds, wear a scarf over your mouth during the weather. Over your mouth, guess what? That's not going to help either because guess you can um, catch influenza by breathing it in, right? So that's wrong. Four, you must eat three well-balanced meals a day and exercise daily. This is beautiful advice. You want to give that to anyone. Eat well, right? Eat healthy foods, exercise. But then it says to prevent influenza. Even though that's good advice, you want the person to eat healthy meals, you want them to exercise. Yes, we want them to do that, but not to prevent influenza because it does not prevent influenza. But guess what? Getting your annual flu vaccine, that is the best way of prevention. All right, guys, we're down to our last question. The nurse is accidentally stuck with a needle used to administer an intradermal injection for PPD. Which intervention should the nurse implement first? One, complete the accident occurrence report. Two, immediately wash the area with soap and water. 
Three, ask the client whether she has AIDS or hepatitis. Four, place an antibiotic ointment and bandage on the site. And the correct answer is two. The first thing you're going to do is wash your hands. Okay, that is the first thing you want to do. Um, after you wash your hands, you're going to report this to your manager. Your manager is going to send you to go get tested. They'll do the paperwork, all that stuff later. But the very first thing that you want to do is wash your hands. And guys, this has nothing to do with nothing, but it was a PPD. So just a couple things I want to tell you about PPD, then I'll let you go. Whenever you're doing a PPD for a patient, don't forget, you're going to be doing it where? On the forearm bevel's going to be up it's given intradermally and one ml of the fluids going to be given right so bevel up forearm intradermally one ml guys uh thank you so much for joining me uh during this session i have so many more questions to cover for respiratory so please stay tuned for my part two video if you have not done so already, please make sure you press that notification bell so you know when I upload new videos. And of course, a like and subscribe. Thank you so much for joining me and I'll see you next time.